So my mom got me the best Christmas gift ever this year, and it's this little old pocket guide to science from 1924, written by Dr. R.E. Humphreys from Popular Science Monthly in New York. And I was going through it after she gave it to me, and I was just like laughing so hard, but also really impressed by all the different stuff that's in it. She got this for me for a few reasons, mainly obviously because I love geology and science. I also really love antiques. We actually go antique shopping and my mom's really into gene genealogy and we just love all that kind of stuff, like old stuff pretty much. So when I'm not talking about or learning about old rocks, I'm, I'm looking for old things to put in my house or old books. I already have kind of a few. I have like a whole stack right here. Let's see. Textbook of geology. When is it from? 1944, 1975, 1960. This was a textbook and it was only $7.10. I wish textbooks were that cheap when I was in college. We have the Earth's Dynamic Systems. This was my mom's and my uncle's earth science textbook when they were in middle school. But my house that I'm in right now is was built in 1920. So my house is only four years older than this book that I'm holding. <laughs> I wanted to go through it and kind of just like read through it in this video and share with you because it's really entertaining and fun. And it's also really kind of inspiring to see how far we've come in about a hundred years. And I'm just wondering what science will be like in another hundred years or 200 years. So it's pretty much in a question and answer format, kind of like Google, because obviously Google didn't exist when this book was written. Instead of our phones in our pockets, we had little pocket guides to science. There's like a quote in the first few pages of it and it says, the smallest fact is a window through which the infinite may be seen. It's fitting to this little pocket guide because each question has just like a pretty short, concise answer to it. And I also like it because I really like just learning about random little facts, like random little morsels of information about the world. And obviously I'm into geology, but I'm also really interested in just like the world around me and how things work and history. By learning a really small fact, like the ones in this book, you can kind of go down a whole journey, a whole infinite rabbit hole about any of these topics. So pretty much what I like about, oh no. Oh, this piece was already falling off and my mom taped it for me, but it fell off when I did that. Pretty much what I like about how this is different from all these other books that I uh, showed you is that the they're textbooks and they're not really meant to be like for the typical person of the time. And that's kind of common of science language in general today. It always kind of has been like that with science language. And this pocket guide was geared towards the average person. This also reminds me of, I think I saw a post about it online a long time ago from the New York Public Library, where they showed all these like scanned images of these question and answer cards that people submitted to the library before the internet, before we could ask the internet things. And they would get answers from librarians who would like look these things up in books for people and answer these like really random questions. And they were really similar questions like the ones in this book. Like, is it true that thunderstorms turn milk sour? <laughs> and it says, no, they have no effect on milk at all. The common idea that they do have probably comes from the fact that a summer thunderstorm is likely to come up towards the end of a very hot day. It is the hot day that turns, that sours the milk and not the storm. This book was written or put together, I should say, in a very interesting time historically because World War I just ended a few years ago in 1918. And then the Great Depression started in 1929 when the stock market crashed. So at this time, 1924, people were pretty hopeful and optimistic for what was to come and there was a lot of stuff going on in terms of like scientific inventions and discoveries and lots was happening. So the first chapter is the human machine, which the body, the human body. And I think I'm gonna compare the answers in this book to the answers that I get when I Google the same question. Oh, here's one. Or what is the strongest known poison? A spoonful of which is enough to kill all the people who live on the earth. That's a little 
morbid. And it says, it is a toxin produced by the germ which causes botulism, a kind of food poisoning. Fortunately, this poison is not purchasable, nor could it be kept alive very long, even if it could be secured. I remember when I took a food science class in middle school, they taught us about like food safety. And when we learned about botulism, I was terrified and I thought it'd be much more of a problem in my life than it, than it is. Kind of like how we always are afraid of quicksand as children. It's like a universal experience, I think. Okay, what is the strongest known point? This is very specific question. Okay, so the closest question I could find to that was, what is the strongest natural poison? Oh my god, it's the same answer. Botulinum toxin is the deadliest natural poison in the world. It is produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum, which develops in environments where there's low oxygen. Sounds like the same answer. Okay, the next chapter is how things work. If a ship sinks in the ocean, will it go clear to the bottom or stop partway down? Why would it stop partway down? Does gravity, did people think gravity just stopped working underwater? If it sinks below the surface at all, it will go all the way down. Short answer. I'm not gonna Google that one because that one's pretty obvious. Why does a pencil seem to be bent when it is dipped in a glass of water? I know the answer, it's refraction. This is an effect of what is called the refraction of light. The light rays that come from the underwater part of the pencil are bent or refracted when they leave the water and come out into the air. That makes the part of the pencil that is underwater appear to be displaced from its real position so that it seems to be bent. You can see this by using a little piece of calcite. I'm gonna go find it. Okay, so I got a couple things to demonstrate this. So pretty much the question is asking, why does this happen? You can see that the straw is kind of like in a different, slightly different position under the water. See, as I move it around, you can kind of like see it change. This is a, a mineral called calcite, and this shows the quality of refraction, double refraction actually, really well. So if you put it over a word or like a letter, you'll see that the image of the letter doubles. See it doubling? It's like, oh, there's a good. As I rotate it, you see the the letters change. So that's because of the same thing that this book is talking about, refraction. Next chapter is what things are made of. Chapter three, can diamonds be made artificially? That's an interesting one. Small ones have been made by dissolving carbon in melted iron and allowing it to crystallize as the melted iron cools very slowly and under pressure. No one has succeeded in making large diamonds in this way or in any other way. What is the largest artificial diamond ever made? 100, what? The largest lab grown diamond in the world is a whopping 155 carat disc diamond. I don't even know how big that is. So it's like the size of someone's hand. Why does asbestos not burn? Because it is a mineral and incombustible as nearly all minerals are. The really valuable and unusual thing about asbestos is that it occurs in fibers so that it can be spun and woven and made into cloth or paper or felt like sheets. When did we realize asbestos was bad for you? The first cases of asbestos related illnesses were recorded in 1924 in the British Medical Journal. When did asbestos stop being used in drywall? 1980s. Next chapter, chapter four, the story of the stars. Um, at this time, we hadn't land on the moon, landed on the moon yet and the space race didn't start yet, so this is interesting. Why do the stars twinkle? I actually only learned this recently. I never really thought to like look it up or anything, but it's because of the air. The air is not perfectly transparent. It makes light waver a little, just as things outside seem to waver when we look through a window pane of poor quality glass. This wavering of the light from the stars makes them seem to go out altogether from a moment to moment, that is, they twinkle. It's the atmosphere, it's really just the atmosphere that's changing and moving and not really the star itself. How far away is the farthest star? It is known only by its catalog number, NGC 7006. Its distance is about 220,000 light years. In miles, this equals the most inconceivable figure of... I do not know. 
what number that even is. I'm just gonna Google it. Zero, 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 zero. <laughs> when I Googled that, there was three results total on Google. I was hoping it would just show me like what the number is, like how to print, like how to even say that number, but it's showing me a Google Books result of popular science magazine from January 1925. How far away is the farthest star? Let's see what Google says about that one. 13.4 billion light years or 134 nonillion kilometers. That's 134 followed by 30 zeros. I can't even um, comprehend that. <laughs> Why can we not go to Mars in an airplane? Because there's not enough air between us and Mars, nothing but empty space. An airplane requires air to hold it up. That's not wrong. Are other planets besides Mars supposed to be inhabited? Venus is so much like the Earth that it has been suggested as a possible home of life, but very little is known about this question one way or the other. To date, no definitive proof has been found of past or present life on Venus. Theories have decreased significantly since the early 1960s when spacecraft began studying the planet and became clear that the environment is extreme compared to Earth's. Yeah, so it's definitely nothing like Earth like we thought in the 1920s. And finally, the most anticipated section of the book, the story of the Earth, marked by some lovely water spots on the page. At a recent meeting, of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, a group of the most distinguished geologists of the world got together and tried to decide how long it has been since the Earth was formed. They agreed that it is very old, almost inconceivably old as man counts time. Perhaps the best estimate is four or five billion years. That's surprisingly very, very, very accurate because at the time, based on this book, that was kind of like a crazy idea because uh, a lot of people, a lot of scientists of the time still argued that it was only mil like hundreds of million years old or maybe like a couple billion, but it was, wasn't until 1956 that we came up with the actual fully accepted age. How do we know that the earth is round? The best proof is that ships can sail around it. There are many other proofs. The earth's shadow on the moon is round as seen in eclipses. The curvature of the Earth can actually be measured by delicate surveying instruments. Wireless signals can be sent around the Earth and back to the sending station. Now we can just go out to space and take a picture of it. So flat earthers, take that, because we literally have a picture of the Earth and it's round. <laughs> this one was probably my favorite one because it really shows the age of this book. How do we know that the Earth is slowly shrinking? Because that is the way that mountain ranges are formed. As the earth shrinks, it wrinkles up its surface skin a little, just as the skin of a prune wrinkles up when it dries and shrinks. These wrinkles on the earth are what we call mountains. The rate at which the earth shrinks is very slow, probably not over an inch or two in a century. Mountains don't form by the shrinking of the earth. That's not true. Plate tectonics is why we have mountains. <laughs> and erosion. Why are the stones and streams almost always round? Because the water rolls them around all the time and wears off their corners by knocking them together. Yeah, that's actually, that's it. <laughs> Where did life first appear on earth? There are traces of life in the oldest rocks that we know, rocks which are probably about 1.6 billion years old. It seems to have been very low forms of life and the beginnings of life are probably to be dated about that time. Oh, uh, very wrong. <laughs> 3.7 billion years ago, the earliest life forms we know of were microscopic organisms, microbes, that left signals of their presence in rocks about 3.7 billion years old. I'm pretty sure the life they're talking about in this is algae, but the actual oldest earth that we know of, the oldest life on earth that we know of was microbes. Why are there so many unusual animals in Australia? Australia has been an island cut off from the rest of the world since many millions of years back in the geologic past. Some of the very ancient animals have been able to live on in Australia through competition with newer animal forms. Though competition with newer animal forms has killed them off elsewhere in the world. Is that actually why? That's actually really interesting. I didn't know that. Why does Australia have unique animals? It's isolation from the rest of the world. Yep. So the next chapter is everyday chemistry, but I already read my favorite question from that one, and that's the one about um, 
thunderstorm supposedly turning milk sour. So then the one after that is electricity. What are the northern lights? They are electric glows very high up in the air, sometimes more than 100 miles high. We do not know just what causes them. Professor Vegard of Norway has suggested recently that they are due to electrical discharges among a cloud of dust particles composed of frozen nitrogen gas floating high up in the air. The lights we see in the night sky are in actual fact caused by activity on the surface of the sun. Solar storms on our star's surface give out huge clouds of electrically charged particles. The aurora's characteristic wavy patterns and curtains of light are caused by the lines of force in the Earth's magnetic field. So yeah, it's just the solar stuff from the sun interacting with the Earth's magnetic field at the poles. Next is chapter eight, which is radio. That was like a slightly new commercialized thing. So people are probably curious about like how that even works. Like, why does radio go through walls? Do we hear the actual voice of a singer from a broadcasting station? What is life? What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? Is a stone alive? What is the tallest tree in the world? A kind of eucalyptus or blue gum which grows in Australia. Individual trees of this species have been known to grow 400 feet tall. Hyperion, the tallest trees in the world are redwoods which tower above the ground in California. These trees can easily reach heights of 300 feet. Okay, the last chapter is the story of the mind. This is a great question. Okay, why is yawning catching? I think they means like contagious. Like We all have an unconscious tendency to imitate whatever we see other people do. If everybody around us is in a panic or laughing or running to a fire, it makes us want running to a fire. Yawning when other people do is simply one instance of this tendency to imitate. It is such a common instance because yawning is an easy thing to do and one which we are much more likely to do whenever we feel like it than we are to get in a panic or run to fires. What is known is that the behavior is contagious. The likelihood of yawning increases sixfold according to one study after seeing someone else yawn. It may be related to a phenomenon called social mirroring where organisms imitate the actions of others. Damn it, I was kind of hoping there was like some kind of like scientific contagious aspect of yawning or something. That's so interesting. Now I really want to yawn. Okay, that is going to mark the end of this video because now I am quite tired from reading an entire book in one sitting. Out loud, nevertheless. So I'm going to go rest and drink some water out of my refracted straw in this glass. And I'll see you next time. I hope you learned something. Goodbye.